Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. I believe that visibility is all about being seen for who you truly are and the part that gets skipped over is that inner work that needs to be done to allow yourself to be seen because you can have the best strategy in the world but if you self-sabotage because there is some inner work that has yet to be done no strategy can help you welcome back I hope your week has been awesome so far. If you haven't listened yet to my recent conversations with Mark Devine of The Unbeatable Mind and with Nia Bashan of The Creator Mindset, then go listen in, check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation. Today, I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, May Kate Tseng who's a podcast guesting strategist and the sustainable visibility mentor. She helps introverted and purpose-driven rising leaders who want to become sustainably visible in order to expand their reach, grow their business on their terms and make a deeper impact in the world. She helps her clients be seen for who they truly are, discovering their unique offers or by never forcing them to show up in a way that feels off and out of integrity. In our discussion, Meike talked to me about how to create a safe space for people to share ideas and be visible. We talked about being seen for who you really are, and we talked about a highly effective way to pitch as a guest to a podcast host. Stay tuned for that one. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Meike Tsang. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaViz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from London in the UK, May Kay Tsang, who's a podcast guesting strategist and she helps purpose-driven coaches, copywriters and service providers to become sustainably visible so that they can expand their reach, grow their business on their terms and make a deeper impact. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, May Kay. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you so much for having me, Jürgen. This is the first podcast interview of 2021, so you always remember your first, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yes. I was just going to say that this is the first recording of 2021 for me as well. And um, whilst this will publish later in the year, it is <laughs> the first. So Happy New Year. <laughs> happy New Year to you too and to everybody who's listening. <laughs> Uh, now, Tamara Glick, who is our guest on episode 351, suggested that we have a conversation with you, Mike. Okay? So, be hello to Tamara as well. That's Tamara, isn't yes. it? Yes, Tamara. Yes. Oh, I, yeah. lo I love you, girl, if you're, if you're listening to this. <laughs> so, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> All right. Now, Meike, what, what drives you? What, what, uh, what's your passion about podcasts and particular podcast guesting? Yeah, you know, I've been asked this question a lot because I what I really think about when I actually look at this microphone is that it's a symbolic representation of a voice that becomes amplified when you speak into it. And yes, you know, on the surface, podcast guesting can be an incredible visibility marketing strategy to help you, you know, to build your list and to attract more clients. That's absolutely a part of it but that is absolutely not the core of it because the way that I see this all is really being able to 
provide someone a safe space to share what's really on their heart, what's really on their mind, so they can make that ripple effect that they are pretty much destined to make through the vehicle that is their business. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. And there's a couple of trigger words there that you mentioned that I'd like to explore a little bit more, but um, let's come back to the idea of um, what you're saying in your overview, and that's becoming sustainably visible. Mm. What do you mean by that? Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. So this is actually, at the time of this recording, this has started to come into fruition. This is my sustainable visibility movement. And it's all about really looking beyond the strategy because um, some of the questions that you'll ask later on, um, this is probably going to have a little bit of overlap I'll share now. And I've always seen gaps in the market and not always from the perspective that most people think when it's like, oh, okay, so you find the gap, create a new solution. Great. And I'm like, yes, but I'm also looking at what's skipped over. What has been band-aided? What has been ignored? because what works right now is good enough. And in the realm of visibility, I kept seeing conversations happening. That was like, just get be, get visible, be more visible, put yourself out there. And don't get me wrong, action and strategies is a part of the process. However, I feel that there's a part of it that's completely skipped over. And that is the acknowledgement of how much courage it takes somebody to actually share themselves with the world because visibility is not exposure and they've been used synonymously in our space mm. you know it's like oh it's all about exposure for your business i'm like who actually wants to be exposed no one wants to be exposed that it comes <laughs> that comes from a place of it's just it just comes from a place of like kind of being seen without your consent and i believe that visibility is all about being seen for who you truly are. And the part that gets skipped over is that inner work that needs to be done to allow yourself to be seen. Mm. Because you can have the best strategy in the world, but if you self-sabotage because there is some inner work that has yet to be done, no strategy can help you. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's, I mean, there's, there's a really good point there. And I encountered this quite a lot as well. People sort of say, well, I don't want to go on camera or I don't want to... I don't like the sound of my voice and and so that that's certainly those are certainly belief systems that you need some inner work to overcome those because nobody else cares about the sound of your voice or how you look on camera they really care about what it is you can help them with um and I like the the idea of building that safe space so talk to us a little bit more about what what do you do to kind of make it feel safe for those people that have those beliefs, make it feel safe for them to get their message out into the world in whatever way that that resonates best with them. Yeah, so just before this this podcast interview, I was actually mentoring my students inside of my group program and the very first part of the process isn't strategy as you can probably imagine the first phase is actually called the soul dive and the reason for that is so that we do have that space to explore and experiment and just to really understand why we're not showing up the best way that we can so um you know for me personally i've actually been through a couple of traumatic experiences including some experiences of sexual abuse so I have had done a lot of healing work, especially over the last couple of years, to help me feel comfortable around men, for example, because I have received um, many unwanted messages or videos even of just completely inappropriate things. And it's made me want to literally duck and hide in my business. In fact, this time last year, there was a situation that happened when um, there was a man who sent me a a very inappropriate message and it was in the middle of the launch and it, it did make me want to run and hide and so there's a lot of work that I did this year on my chakras in particular that really helped me come to terms with that and now I have a much more stronger way of being able to handle it without 
um, without hardening my heart, because I feel that for, because as a sensitive soul myself, I've often been told growing up, like, oh, we just need to, just need to grow a thicker skin, just need to get over it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, I don't want to, I want to maintain my sensitivity, but also feel strong enough and emotionally, emotionally resilient enough to be able to fend off these attacks that actually come from a place of malice. So yeah. what's really important for me, whether um, I work with people um, in my in my free Facebook community or in a paid capacity, what I really do is I really vet the people who come in. So not just anybody can come into my space. They need my permission. And so for example, in a Facebook group, that could mean answering a couple of questions. If they just request to join and they don't answer the questions, I know they're either just going to be a lurker or they could be detrimental to the collective. So that's what I really do to help create that safe space first and foremost. And it's really always been helpful for my community and my clients when they see me do it as well. So I'm Mm. always consciously trying to walk my talk because I am the living embodiment of my work. And as soon as my community and my clients see that, they feel like they can trust themselves to do it too in this space. yeah so yeah okay mm. yeah so i mean you know one of the things you talked about the advice of grow a thicker skin mm. and so on and in some ways you know i think about that from time to time when i get some uh, comments that i find a little hurtful and i think well you know there's no need to react like that and of course none of those comments bear any sort of they're they're not on the same scale as as the jerk that you talked about um giving you grief so uh, but at the same time it is an indication that we care deeply right about the response we get for our message so how do you how do you or what kind of work did you do on yourself to say okay that's you know there's jerks out there that do stuff like that which is just ridiculous i do i mean i don't understand what motivates those people but they're obviously there and how do you what sort of work do you do on yourself to say well you know i can control i'll I'll control what i can control and put up some protection so that that's risk is minimized but at the same time still get my message that i want to share with people that want to listen to that message and who I can help yeah but I love this question and something that I do for myself and I also teach my clients as well is to literally create a safe space like a physical safe space for you so for example well no one can see this um and you actually can't see it either Jürgen but in front of me, I have some items that are placed um, specifically for me to make me feel like, yes, this is my safe space. Nothing is actually happening. This is somebody on the interwebs who has not so great intentions. And I have to remind myself I'm physically safe because our bodies react based on a situation that's either real or it's actually imagined or it's just been exaggerated in your mind because of, there is a perceived threat right in front of you. Mm. So I literally create a safe space. So in front of me, for example, I have this note um, that reminds me that I get to choose the opportunities that come towards me. I don't have to take anything. And that's just, that's the same for everybody else. You don't have to do anything. You get to do the things you do. <laughs> mm. And I also have um, a money plan in front of me. And while you'd think that that would represent money, and it, it probably does, but what I, what the, yeah, <laughs> my mind's just gone blank for a second. Brain fart. Um, but yeah, so this money plant, what it represents to me is the fact that my mother gave it to me. And she, at the beginning of my business, she wasn't as supportive because it was new. None of my family members mm. ran a business online before. So of course, it's going to be a threat in a sense to her. And of course, she's going to protect me because I'm her child. But the fact that she's given that to me, to me, represents that she wants me to succeed and she's seen my growth now and she doesn't question what I do in the fact she supports it and that's really beautiful and then across my desk I have my beautiful journal I've got this cup with a cute smiley face on it I have my crystals nearby so I literally create an embodied space and if I need to go even further if my external space isn't enough to help me then I 
get really um I just drop into my senses because if you had a, a luxurious piece of chocolate, for example, you don't eat in times of panic. You may stress eat, sure, but mm. in times of panic where you actually feel that like you're under threat, you don't eat. So the simple act of like just really enjoying this beautiful piece of chocolate is melting on your tongue really nice and slowly you can you can taste you know the milks you can taste the sugars whatever it is it doesn't have to be chocolate if you're not a chocolate person but that also really helps and even just the physical touch like just like literally like just take your hand and touch your face or just like just grace your hands stand stand as well so that your feet are physically grounded all of these practices have always made me feel extremely safe when in the moment I feel like I'm under threat from somebody. Mm. And that has been incredible to really fall back on these things that um, you actually don't actually need anything external if you actually just have yourself. And I think that's a really beautiful thing to remember that we are all we need mm. really to make us feel yes, just uh, be reminded of it. Mm. We have everything inside of us that we need. Um, yeah, what I like, what I really like about that is you, you're essentially creating triggers in your environment that trigger pleasant memories and essentially change your mindset at yeah. at an instant, right? Yes. Hmm. It's all on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's yeah. That's great advice. So you can design your environment to feel much safer and there, there's lots of ideas there but of course it has to be very personal mm -hmm. yes okay now how did how did you get into this um podcasting game because i think you're you started out with your business with sort of different different services and different ideas yes i absolutely did so this came by complete and i mean truly complete accident <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of years ago I was a launch strategist and copywriter and I had just finished coming out from under a wing of a mentor because I'd worked with him for a year and I saw firsthand what it took to take a business from zero to six figures and I was on the front lines of 13 live launches <laughs> in a year and it, it was a crazy amount of work and it's not work that I felt aligned to continue and we both had that agreement that in the long term he saw me as an entrepreneur not as an entrepreneur he would continue building his business so it was kind of like it was my sign to leave and he really helped me at the beginning um, my mentor and he sent some referrals my way so I had some referrals and it was wonderful and so I didn't really have to do any active marketing so you can probably see where this is going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, I was completely complacent with my marketing efforts. So all of those referrals suddenly dried up one day. And I was under the guidance of a couple of new mentors, specifically in the copywriting space. And they said to me, Meike, you need to get on podcasts. And I was like, great. <laughs> but how do I do that? <laughs> And the good thing is that I had been trained to find a way if I didn't know how. So yes, you know, this idea was plumped in front of me and I literally just had to go for it. So I learned all firsthand and I challenged myself because I really thrive on challenges. Um, I challenged myself to pitch to 101 podcasts in 30 days. <sighs> And it was through that process that I became an accidental podcast guesting expert because all of my copywriting peers, they were suddenly reaching out and asking, how did you get on so many podcasts? Because my success rate was actually one in three. So it's a 33% mm. booking rate and that's not including follow-up. And so I knew I was onto something and then I decided to launch a program to help my fellow peers to yeah. you know help them guess on podcasts and then it was through that launch that a mastermind peer of mine she actually referred a one-on-one -on -one client for this podcast guesting and i was like wait there's demand for this in you know for one-on-one -on -one work that's amazing so 
I got that one on referral. And then suddenly as I started to share my work more and more, I started getting booked out. And that is how my services evolved from launch strategy and copywriting just purely into podcast guesting. And at the time of this recording, I have just retired my pitch services. So I no longer pitch my clients because this is a conversation that we can have later on. Um, all about being aware of which industry standards I'm upholding and which ones am I fueling. And I just decided that pitching for my clients wasn't where my soul work was. I mm. felt like I was called to do something bigger. And sustainable visibility right now is my calling because it's all about doing the inner work before your business and yourself is fully seen. So mm. that's, that, that was the twist into the topsy turvy yeah. twist and turn of the journey so far. It's, it's fascinating because, um, I mean, as, as a uh, long time podcast host, I've seen just like you would have with your podcast, um, lots of pictures and that made me cringe yes <laughs> um, and and the the best example i've had I don't know if we can share some best examples here was um dear so-and-so and it wasn't my name it was somebody else's name now i happen to know who that was because they'd been a guest on my podcast oh, God. and it said we love the we love the xyz podcast and it was their podcast oh no <laughs> and, and we listened to every episode and can we please come and be a guest or can it was written by somebody else can so-and-so please come and be a guest on your innova buzz podcast so they actually changed their template at the end to, mm. to address my <laughs> podcast but the rest of it was still you know they hadn't done the search and replace and i thought well you know I, and i actually went back to the person and i said if you use a temp, can I give you a tip? If you use a template, and I don't really encourage using templates, but if you do use a template, make sure you get your search and replace steps right, <laughs> and get the name of the person right, and so on. And um, you wouldn't believe this, but they actually came back and followed up on that without responding to that feedback, but just said, "When can we arrange the interview?" <laughs> and I said, oh "I don't think so." <laughs> Oh dear, yeah, they they just completely crossed themselves out for yeah. more. <laughs> yeah, I actually I, I looked I looked the guest up that they mentioned. I did do a Google search and looked them up, and they probably would have been a, uh, well, they probably had stuff to value to add. Whether they would have been a good guest or not, I don't know. But I didn't pursue that, and I thought, well, you know, the pitching part is something that. I see so many bad ones and I think, mm -hmm. why not just record a two minute video? It takes you two minutes yeah. <laughs> and tell me why. And I actually recorded a, a series of videos where I said, um, here's, you know, if you want to get on my podcast, here's how you do it. And it was funny because I'd received a pitch and I hadn't, no, it was one of the ones that I ignored. Um, I'd received a pitch from somebody who saw my series of videos and then sent me the most fabulous pitch because they paid attention to all the videos and they said now i understand why i didn't get a response to my first pitch <laughs> and yeah. here's, here's my new pitch and i said <laughs> oh good come on the show <laughs> yes oh my goodness the power of video pitches is i swear that like no one's talking about it and mm. it's it's because it's the one that you can't outsource and it's the same with the voice pitch you can't outsource your voice you can't mm. outsource you and that's the thing with written pitches you either have to do written pitches extremely well or you can bite the bullet and do the thing that rarely no one else does which is voice or video pitches mm. and all the ones i've sent have had a hundred percent success rate so <laughs> mm. so you can rarely go wrong with a video or voice pitch that's personalized so how do you how do you approach the voice or the video pitch? So I I employ something that I've just dubbed now is the is the PR method, which doesn't yeah. stand for uh, personal relations actually. Yeah, yeah. It stands for personalization and relevancy. Mm -hmm. So super simple to remember, and that's all I need to do in a video pitch. So there's actually seven steps that I have in that I have in place for a written pitch. 
but for the sake of keeping a video pitch method short, I of course address them by their name and I quickly introduce who I am and why I've come across their podcast and something that I love about their podcast. I, I make sure I never blag that it because if anyone's going to receive a video pitch, they deserve to receive mm. it from somebody who's actually paid attention. So I'll include some detail in there that shows that I have listened to a couple of episodes and the things that I pointed out. And I will share a topic that I feel is going to be beneficial for their audience and why, how their interview can be laid out, a couple of bullet points, and I just leave it up to them if they are open to further discussing if they think that it would be good fit. But what's really important about any pitch I have ever sent, whether it's written or voice or a video, is the fact that I always leave the ball in their court. I call it the no pressure sign off where I literally say whether or not I'm a good fit, I truly wish you all the best for your show, um, insert name. <laughs> mm. And that's pretty much it. And it's that level of detail, is that level of personalization and genuine care that you actually want to contribute something valuable to their audience. That's what they're going to feel. But if, mm. um, because I've received a lot of pitches and I often feel quite coerced to say yes, and if I ever feel any sense of dread or I feel a part of my body that's really like cramped up, then I, I already know they're not a good fit, even though I haven't actually spoken to them because all of those telltale signs really paint a picture of who they are. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, I love that process. And there's, I think there's three or four things there immediately that to me are really important. And I just want to reemphasize those for for the listener and that's first of all you know if i'm the guest i'm coming on your show to add value to your audience and here's how i believe i can do that so that you know making sure that the podcast host knows that your intent is to add value to the audience and yes there's a whole lot of side benefits from that exposure and all that kind of stuff but the intent is to add value to the audience so that's the first big point mm -hmm. i think that you know i look for certainly when i'm being pitched um, the second one is taking the time beforehand to actually listen to podcast episodes and then not just saying oh, i listen to the episode i love your podcast because any, everybody can say that mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be true um, to then say hey i heard you um your conversation with Maykay and you know I I loved your points about working on your own mindset first before you get out into podcasts as a guest so actually picking up a point and demonstrating that you've listened to it but also something that then can lead back into that here are the things that I'd like to discuss because I've got a view on that as well I've got you know I've got a different view on that or I've got some additional things that can reinforce that view, whatever it might be. Yeah. And then the third, the third really important point is keep it really short, leave the ball back in their court without putting pressure on. Mm -hmm. And I think the fourth one for me is if you do video or audio, the person you're pitching gets to see who you really are and they also yeah. get to see if you're on camera. So if you're kind of like stuttering or you're hiding a little bit, they see, well, you know, maybe that's not the guest I want on the show. Or if it's somebody that really is confident about their knowledge without being arrogant, then, okay, that might be a good guest for my show. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you, that you shared that because you know, a video, they're going to see you on video. Like right now we're using Squadcast, for example. So we see each other and now you hear my voice and whether like, because a podcast is an audio show. So if you're not going to do video, at least do audio if you can, because they're already going to paint a picture of who you are based on how you speak and, you know, how eloquent are you when you speak? Do you like, it's okay to stutter here and there. Like I had a brain fart earlier. That's normal. <laughs> But, you know, if that happened all the time, then that may not be the best representation of how you can be as a guest, but it already gives them an insight into how you can be on their show. Hmm. Okay. Now, you talked also about that you felt you had a calling, you felt that there was something bigger you needed to do that, that you know, really drives you in some ways. 
So how can um, so how can people, you know, if they've got ideas there? I mean, I feel a little bit like this whole podcast guesting thing needs a bit of a revamp, and that's what I really like about the work you're doing because I think it, that it's a really good direction. I mean, if we get guests really well prepared to go on podcasts and do the things that add most value to that podcast's audience, then every podcast becomes a better podcast. Um, so ha what advice do you give to somebody who kind of thinks, I've got this thing that I've, I want to improve and how can I step up my game so that I get started in that and make a contribution there? So it's for anybody else. So my example is podcast guesting into sustainable visibility, but you're asking about what if it's someone else with something different, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I think what really helped for me was just becoming aware of what message or what industry standard was I perpetuating as a result of offering this service. And I've had some incredible clients that I've worked with and I do not regret that for a single second. However, there were some clients who never came to be because I was aware of their approach to podcast guesting. They saw it as something that's completely transactional and they just saw me as someone just to do the dirty work for them. And not to say that it's, no, actually no, it's not dirty work, it's um, grunt work, <laughs> <laughs> right? So yeah, it's a lot of work to do the research and the pitching and the follow-up, absolutely. However, I always chose clients that actually cared about the process, like they know when to stand back and not to do the trench grunt work, but they also care enough to stay involved in the process. And that's what I looked for in my clients. And I noticed as my demand kept increasing, I started attracting clients like that as well, who only cared about what they could get out of it. And it's fine to be, you know, strategic and everything, making sure you have a lead magnet if you want to build your list or, you know, to have, um, you know, calls available on your calendar if you want to book in more one-on-one -on -one clients. That's fine. However, only caring about the number of podcasts that they can be on and what ranking they have it really put me off and I noticed that like oh this is what I'm doing if I serve clients like these mm. they only care about that so the bigger calling for me was just really acknowledging what's the bigger picture and I really wanted to serve clients who cared about the before during and after really starting and maintaining and growing these relationships that they build because every podcast host, in a sense, they are, they're a leader, right? Mm. So why wouldn't you want to maintain that relationship? And then when I saw the even bigger picture of visibility, because podcast guessing is one part of four segments that I see visibility in. And so that's why I wanted to really do some greater work on really helping introverts in particular I'm an extroverted introvert, so I can speak to both sides, but I'm definitely more introverted if I had to choose. <laughs> and I noticed that for them, they just saw visibility as a, a one is either you have it or you don't. Like it was black mm. and white, but there's plenty of gray area that I wanted to explore and to give permission to those where it's not natural for them to be in the spotlight, to find different ways that they can really capitalize on their skills and their personality without feeling like they're breaching who they are. So that's what I feel called to do, to help people find their own visibility style, to explore different ones from their own sense of personal safety, as well as strategy for their business. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Uh, and there are quite a few trigger words there that uh, um, resonated with me. I mean, you talked about transactions versus building relationships and I think that's core to my whole philosophy I mean we we do a lot of work in the marketing space and my philosophy around that is let's make marketing human again because I think mm -hmm. that's um, degenerated very much into a lot of transactional stuff with particularly with automation that's available today um, and I've started talking about networking and podcasting saying let's make that human again too so it's kind mm -hmm. of like it's a natural expansion so I love the the trans 
Tran- somebody said to me transformation versus transaction, which yeah. is another one that I love because I talk about transformational marketing. So mm. it's sort of all coming together. So I feel as though I'm starting to get all these messages that this is where I need to go to. Yeah. And the other thing I loved about what you said is the introvert versus extrovert spectrum. I mean, I did, when I tell people I'm an introvert, they say, but you get on video and you get on podcasts and stuff. And I say, well, yeah, that costs me a lot of energy to do that. Mm. Whereas an extra work, extrovert would cost them a lot of energy not to do it. So <laughs> yeah. that, that's the difference. It's not that I can't get in front of a microphone or a camera and speak. It's that I have to feed that energy from inside as opposed to mm. um, drawing it in from the interactions. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's not that introverts are incapable of doing video or or voice or whatever visibility style that you're Mm. using. It's it's just a matter of your personal capacity. How much does it take for you to do all of these things? And that's what, you know, that's what makes it sustainable, being aware of your personal capacity. So for podcast interviews, I can do probably about four a month if I wanted to. I normally keep it to one or two because I am aware of the marketing that happens after a podcast interview. You don't just show up and leave. <laughs> you show up, yeah. keep the relationship going, keep marketing it. I mean, like Tamara is a beautiful example of this. Like she just, um, you know, marketed the her Anova Buzz podcast interview again. Like she, I've seen her do it a couple of times now. So that's a beautiful example of what every podcast guest should be doing. <laughs> and I don't mm. think it a lot, but in this case, I will. But yeah, so it's not about incapability. It's about your personal capacity for visibility. Hmm. All right. Um, so you talked about earlier about research and um, the potential guest being involved in the process mm. um, as opposed to many of the services that are out there where they essentially do everything except appear on the podcast <laughs> with the guest. So is is that a kind of, you know, two two sides of a different coin or is there a continuum in between? Well, I can absolutely see the appeal for clients um, to hire people to do these services where they do every they don't do anything apart from show up i i do i get the appeal (laughs) absolutely Mm. however for something as personal as podcast guesting it is based on relationships and the the kind of connection you have with the host the closer you are with the host the better the conversation is naturally going to be so like even though we haven't personally spoken before Jürgen, like we had a beautiful connection through tamara and so mm. i already knew like i had complete trust like, oh well you know i love tamara mm. i know what she's all about i love the people that she's friends with so i already knew that there was going to be a connection and like i am absolutely tooting my own horn here i absolutely do i think we do <laughs> have a great mm. connection and just based on how we are speaking so um the things that you can absolutely outsource are going to be you know the the pitching you can outsource the research as well but here's how you can personalize the whole thing so when you are researching just be aware of how you're vetting all of these um, podcasts that are going on your final spreadsheet so for Mm. example you're naturally going to want to pick a podcast that is still active first and foremost (laughs) that's important (laughs) and of course you want to pick one that even interviews guests you want to know whether they are accepting guests right now so Right now, I'm fully booked for guests until May 2021. It might even spread to June 2021 because I've mine is more relationship slash invite only that has only been mm. fairly recent. But my point is, on my website, I do say on my podcast page, I'm not looking for guests. So the fact that I'm still receiving pitches means that they haven't paid attention. They haven't yeah. taken that extra minute just to look at my website to see if I'm taking guests or not. So you can dramatically improve your chances of having your pitch received um, by you know vetting through these processes and of course ensuring that the the person who you're pitching for if you're doing it from somebody else that the podcast host values align with the guests because Mm. there's no point in having 
um, a conversation where they're clashing on every single belief. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you want them. Well, to yeah. Well, like, that could that could be interesting. It could be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, the values misalignment does kind of lead to a um, probably less value for the listener, which is the important thing. Yes, absolutely, and that's what needs to be at the front focus at all times is that you're thinking of the host and the audience who they have nurtured over who knows lot, how long they could be for months for years even spanning for decades who knows mm. but it's always having that as a front focus first and foremost and when you are pitching if you are doing it from somebody else then that obviously means that you're doing written pitches and you can write a beautiful written pitch so long as it's relevant and personalized and it sounds so simple because it is <laughs> that mm. i mean you and i can both agree that we've received pictures when it's the wrong name or there's no name and it's the wrong information and it's just like i don't care how great their pitch is if they if they miss my name or mm. if they miss um oh, sorry if they spell my name incorrectly which i truly don't understand because it's in the email address yeah. that they're sending it to yeah. i'll forgive them if they don't have a hyphen because i don't have a hyphen in my email address however if they get anything else wrong i just think to myself clearly you're not detail orientated and i don't want someone on my show who doesn't care about the details because i do hmm. all right um this is fabulous mike i've just had a look at the clock and thinking <laughs> gee, is it that time already so i think it's no. probably time we moved on i just wanted to um mention one thing and and get your thoughts on this i've started um running some events connecting podcast guests and podcast hosts so they're kind of anti-networking events so it's the theme is make networking human again mm -hmm. uh, so i'm starting to bring that theme into everything um but it's um it's interesting because that uh to me that allows people an opportunity to meet and to explore whether um, the other person they've met would be a good podcast guest or would be a good uh, podcast for them to go on. And rather than it's not pitching, it's just getting to know people mm -hmm. and it kind of bypasses some of the research steps as well. So I'm exploring that as a way to add value to my community of both podcasters and and people that want more visibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that sounds really cool. I like how you say that it's like an anti-networking sort of thing. <laughs> it's, it's almost like a matchmaking service, but for podcasters and podcast guests, yeah. which is wonderful. And if that's what they're looking for and there is that even exchange, because I think what's important to remember is that every host, they, you know, they yet to choose. They, they can never be forced to say yes to somebody mm. like, well, you know, the guests can try um, from the pitch and everything. But at the end of the day, as a podcast host, you know, we get to choose who we have on our shows. And so long as there's mutual consent, mutual interest, and there's an even exchange, then I think that's a beautiful idea. Hmm. All right. Well, thanks for this. As I say, I'm um, aware of the time and want to be respectful of your time too. So I think it's a good time now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation around. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So um, I've got specific questions now. These are scripted questions, unlike our previous conversation. And um, they hopefully we'll get some really insightful answers from you today to these five questions. And that'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result. Oh, no pressure, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So what what since this is an innovation podcast primarily what's what do you think the number one thing is anyone needs to do to be more innovative so as well as being aware of which messages and which industry standards you're upholding with your own messaging with your own offers services products i think what's really important for um, anyone who wants to innovate is to actually have the courage to try not necessarily ex succeed right from the get-go because we never know what's going to succeed of course there are going to be predictions based on your own research and everything but at the end of it all in order to innovate you have to try hmm. yeah i think i i certainly agree with you there i think we 
hamper ourselves a lot through fear of failure. And yet, if you take the approach that this is just an experiment, and if the experiment doesn't work, what can I learn from this, then it's not a failure. Um, and then do the next experiment based on what you've learned. Mm. Hmm. So what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? So an example is my sustainable visibility movement. It's where I've actually seen the steps that have been skipped. So other people can call them market gaps. I just think of hmm, what has been glossed over because it's not convenient to go into. Um, I'm more than happy to open the, um, <laughs> what's the analogy? I think it's a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, and actually have the responsibility to see it through to the end because I, I can completely understand, of course, when you're working with something like trauma, for example, of course, you absolutely need to be trained in it. It's not something to be taken lightly at all. So just want to put that out there. But um, for anything else, I think it is really important to see what has been glossed over in our industry. And that's something that I have seen in visit and, you know, in the visibility conversations in the online space. And I actually started talking to people and I started seeing the need that I never knew they had. And as soon as I mentioned those words, sustainable visibility, it literally has stopped people in that track. It stopped them from speaking it, and they're just like in awe of it. And they're like, mm. they literally have said to me, wow, no one has ever put it that way. And this is so needed. So being open minded and looking at the things that have probably been lost over and actually being willing to dive into that has been the best thing I've ever done to create the things I've created. Mm. And, and what I like also is that you've had conversations then with potential clients yeah. and, and kind of laid it bare and said, here's an idea that I'm exploring. Yeah. And, and based on the feedback, you've decided there's something here. Yeah. And I'm sure you've probably adapted adapted what you're doing based on feedback as well. Of course. <laughs> mm. All right. Now, do you have a favorite resource you use most often? Um, do you mean like a book or a system? or? <laughs> It could be anything. <laughs> um, okay, it's not groundbreaking or anything, but <laughs> what really helps me is to free write in a beautiful journal. Um, I even make sure that the pens that I use are ones that feel really great in my hand and the ink flows beautifully because when I get in the zone, I feel that sometimes it feels like I'm not the one writing. I feel like my writing is a channel for a greater message to come through my fingertips. And sometimes I can't even believe what I've written because it's not in my train of thought. So it feels like it comes from somewhere else. And I think that's a really beautiful thing because that allows me to be open to what I'm meant to see in that moment. Mm. So yeah, nothing uh, fancy. How do, you, <laughs> how do you get started with that writing and those prompts? So you got to prompt yourself to get started. So I actually don't write on a schedule, so I'm not a very, not to say I'm not disciplined or anything, but I, I do, I'm a very intuitive person, which you may have picked up from this conversation. And I just go whenever I feel like it. Um, I, when I feel inspired, even if I don't know why I'm inspired, I just find myself like having my journal in front of me. So I'm looking at it right now and I personalized it and what it says on the front, cause I'm a Taurus first and foremost, but there is a little message at the bottom and it says answering the universe's call. So every time I read that, I feel that I'm already primed to be open mm. to whatever the universe is trying to tell me. And my pen is just a way for the universe to communicate that with me. Mm. All right. I've just grabbed um, my four Lamy pens, which I've had for years and years. And I have them here on my desk. So if I, I don't do a lot of free writing because I kind of sit down in front of a blank paper and that's why I asked the question about the prompts. But, um, but um, when I do, I love to use those pens. Mm. Yeah, just something look. about the whole kinesthetic feeling that comes yeah. with it. Exactly. It's not the same as typing on a keyboard. <laughs> yes, that's right. 
All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a client on track? So I appreciate that all of my clients are individuals. And as much as I can try to pop them into their, um, you know, certain categories based on their personality types, etc., I literally ask them beforehand. I ask them, how do you love to be supported? How can I best celebrate your successes when they happen? And when you are off track, because life can happen, how can I best reach out to you? And when they tell me, I keep a note of it. So I know exactly mm -hmm. how to speak directly to them. Because for example, if I'm off track, um, I don't respond well to people just telling me to just get back on it. <laughs> like, yeah. get back on the bandwagon. Like, clearly that stuff doesn't work for me. I need someone to approach me with compassion and understanding as to why I may be in this place that's not so inspiring. And then just having that permission to feel and then I come out of it on my own because I've been given permission to just feel it out because I am British born Chinese and in my family when I was growing up, I didn't have a lot of opportunity to express my emotions because, you know, it's not really a thing in Chinese culture, at least not from my family to openly yeah. express. So I learned to suppress it all. But yeah. of course, in my and, coaching journey, and it's yeah. not really a thing in British culture either, is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you, you, so, so you had sort of two <laughs> combination. <laughs> exactly. So the interesting combination to have grown up with. But with my line of work, I need to be the living embodiment of what I do. So if I'm asking my clients to open up, then how can I not? So I need to do that work alongside them. So that's how I keep a client on track. I ask them how and I follow through when I need to. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great approach. I love it. Mm. All right. Um, what's, and what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Ah, so I believe it's important to share one's blooper reel, not just their highlight reel. And I noticed at one point on my Instagram feed, for example, I noticed that, you know, a lot of my photos have been from photo shoots because of course I do want to have a, you know, some professionalism. However, there was a time where I felt like there wasn't enough realness to it. So I did a Facebook and Instagram live when I had no makeup on and I started talking about it. <laughs> and I'm like, look, everyone, yes, I have bags under my eyes when I don't have makeup on. I have very gappy eyebrows. I have spots on my chin. <laughs> so, you know, not perfect by any means. However, I feel that more people need to see that side. I feel that there's a big fear of um, you know, they can guise it as like, oh, I'm not being professional though, if I'm like that, mm. but that may be a part of it, but isn't the real fear of being seen for who you are and being rejected. Mm. So I feel that to help differentiate yourself, to be honest with the blooper reels, the things that go wrong in your business and really owning that. Like, of course, don't, in my opinion, I don't think it's right to share it in the moment when you're still going through it. I think it's wiser to share when it's become a scar, not an open wound, when it's something that you've actually bounced back from and you can share your lessons. Because when you're going through it, you have that danger of projecting your triggers and your emotions onto those who aren't ready to receive it. So I think it's a responsible thing to share your scars and not your wounds. And I've noticed that when I share these blips in my business journey, my audience really responds to it. So. Mm example don't want to go on too long but a quick example is uh, this time last year i shared a podcast in uh, uh, sorry a podcast episode on my podcast the quiet rebels and i the title was behind the scenes of my three figure launch so <laughs> it's a couple of hundred <laughs> dollars because yeah. what you hear you only hear the six figures the That's multiple right. mm. figures, the million dollars and i'm like hey here's a three figure launch i want to share with you all about <laughs> and they respond extremely well. So my audience knows that I'm going to tell them what really goes on. And I recently surveyed them and they, and I asked them, what kind of episodes do you want? And they're like, we want the deeper conversations. We don't just want strategy, Like, yeah, we want strategy, but we want the deeper conversations of what really goes beyond, um, you know, beyond the screen, <laughs> like what happens in your day to day life? How do you handle that? So to differentiate yourself, share your blooper reels. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And I, lo and I love your example because I think um, one of the things we talked about earlier about people feeling hesitant to get on camera or to 
take the first step to increase their visibility is that there's this perception there that there's all these successful people out there and they just went out and did certain things and became successful. Well, no, they had lots of failure along the way as well. And because they, because all you see is the big success, um, you believe that if you don't hit that in the first go, then you're never going to make it, which is completely wrong. So to see successful people share that, hey, you know, I messed up something else over here, but there was a lesson in that, or I had a good laugh over myself over that, or whatever it might be, um, and that that almost gives them permission to say, well, okay, I'll try something, even because even if it does fail, I can I can add to my blooper reels. Yes. Exactly, and blooper reels are the best to watch anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, uh, uh, the best ones I find are the when you've got a really serious, heavy movie, um, and it's very emotional, and it's kind of throwing up all kinds of conflict, and you know, it it's the sort of movie where if you watch it with somebody close to you, you have conversations for hours later and debates about whether you know this character did the right thing or whatever and then they put on this five minute blooper reel right at the end where you know they stumble over their lines or they yeah. do the wrong thing or they forget their lines and everybody cracks up laughing and i think that puts a totally different um spin on on the movie yeah it does it rehumanizes the experience because everything mm. that we see on screen is actually scripted right like yeah. rarely right. any of it is really improvised so it's lovely to see that those behind the scenes i think that's why people love seeing behind the curtain <laughs> so much mm. because it makes them feel more human because they're like ah oh, we're actually similar yeah so, yeah, yeah. make it all more human yep <laughs> great theme all right well thanks may Kay. this has been fabulous now where can people find out more about you maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared and i hope that i don't have any listeners that uh, jerks like the one you talked about earlier oh. today <laughs> i'm sure you don't no worries but thank you so much for having me and yeah so for those who would love so you know when you gave an example of uh you did your own series of how to basically get booked on your podcast right yeah <laughs> so i have a beautiful collective resource where i have 25 podcasters pretty much sharing their own personal roadmaps of how to pitch them so that one is called Be Our Podcast Guest, and it's 25 proven ways that you can get booked on podcasts in 2021 and beyond. So to go to, uh, to get that resource for free, all you need to do is go to 25experts.makeysang.com. And of all the social media platforms, I am most active on Instagram, so you can find me at makeysang. All right, and we'll have links to those in the show notes as well, so people can click straight through. Thank you. All right. Now, um, do you have any parting advice for our listener today? Yes, I do. And it's it's been a theme that's been interwoven beautifully for our conversation today. And it's to really be the best leader that you can, to be an innovative leader. I truly believe it's important to be the embodiment of your work. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's um, definitely something that resonates with me too. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Um, finally, finally, May Kay, who else should I get on this podcast and why? Oh, do you know, I feel like I'm picking between my favorite children and I don't have children yet. <laughs> so to all of my friends who are listening to this and you're thinking, why didn't you choose me? It's not personal. But the first person who comes to mind for me is my friend Iman Zabi. And she has been incredibly innovative in her copywriting business. And she's not just a copywriter anymore. And what she's most known for right now is her new course platform called Terrain.io. And what's mm. really different about this is that instead of a marketplace that, that you just send in your course and it's up there, she has her team curate all the content to ensure that only the best of the best get onto this platform. And you know <laughs> who I'm talking about here because you're, all, you're already on this platform, which is amazing. And yeah, I think it's a really beautiful way to innovate the, the course creation platform industry because there are millions of courses out there and not all of them have actually been completed, <laughs> let alone mm. 
you know achieve the results that yeah they yeah, promised that's... so that's what i really love around this mm. so highly well, we have had we have had Iman on previously to talk about her copywriting business, but yeah, you raise a good point there with with her new platform terrain. Um, we probably should get her on to talk about that. Yeah, mm. highly recommend. <laughs> Again. All right. Well, thanks a lot, May Kay. Um, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights today. I, I love the work you're doing. I think there's huge value in that. I think it's it, it can totally transform the whole podcasting industry particularly these podcasts where people get together to have conversations and for those people that are looking to be more visible through podcasting to prepare them in a way that they I mean it's in their best interests to turn up as their best but also in the way that they add most value to the podcast that they come on so thanks for sharing all that with us today I wish you all the best for the future and let's stay in touch Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed that engaging and informative conversation with May Kay and took something away from her episode. I really love the idea of the sustainable visibility movement that May Kay has launched and is championing. And of course, it is congruent with my philosophy of making marketing and podcasting more human. I'm curious to know what you took away from Makay's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Makay Tsang. That's spelt M-A-I-K-E-E-T-S-A-N-G. M-A-I-K-E-E-T-S-A-N-G all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Tsang. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with May Kay, as well as links to her website, her social media pages, and all the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. If you like this episode, please share it with a couple of other people that it might help. People who might have a message that they want to get out into the world, but they're not sure how and maybe don't feel safe in doing that. Tag me in that share and I'll reach out to you with a special surprise. Make suggested that we have a conversation with Iman Zabi, who previously appeared on episode 270 of the Anova Buzz podcast episode. This time, Make suggested that we talk to her about her terrain platform. So, Iman, keep an eye on your inbox for a return invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of May Kay Tsang. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast. We've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including improviser and corporate trainer Gillian Bellinger and playwright and screenwriter Sheldon Shaw. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.